right. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Samuelson. I'm the chair of BAFTA's Film Committee. <laughs> and hang on, I'm Joe Twist. <laughs> <laughs> And I am the chair of BAFTA's Games Committee. Hooray. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to this very special showcase event for Kojima Productions' Death Stranding, bridging the worlds of film and game. You can clap now. <laughs> now, as we all know, BAFTA has been celebrating games as an equal to film and television for nearly 20 years. Through our Games Awards and events like this, we are committed to cementing games in their rightful place as an art form, a very important one, as part of our mainstream culture. BAFTA, oh, up here, 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 here. BAFTA's core aim is to inspire, enable, and celebrate talent from across the screen industries. Through events like this one, we also hope to foster the conversation between these worlds and as they grow ever more intertwined. Tonight, we're very fortunate to be joined by two visionary creative voices in film and games for what promises to be an insightful discussion. Now, without further ado, let me introduce your host for this evening, the BBC's Stefan Powell. Thank you, thank you very much. Hello, Shamai. Thank you very much. Thanks to Mark and Joe for um, those words. And welcome to the Mayfair Terrace. Wish you, isn't it? It's lovely. Uh, and welcome also to the people watching at home, those of you that are watching on Twitch, on the BAFTA channel there. Thanks for joining us this evening. We've got some event for you lined up and uh, plenty to talk about in the next hour or so. Uh, my name is Stefan, Stefan Powell, and I work for BBC Radio and Newsbeat. And there I look after our gaming coverage and I'm lucky enough actually just coming back from Tokyo where we've spent three days behind the scenes with Kojima Productions making a documentary about Death Stranding. And I, so I couldn't let this opportunity pass up without saying it's on Monday on the iPlayer, make sure you go and watch it. <laughs> uh, I'll be tweeting out a link, so that'd be great. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. I hope you have um, a great evening. There's plenty for us to talk about. So without further ado, let's introduce the person that you're here to see, Mr. Hideo Kojima. <laughs> Good to see you again. Good evening, everyone. Well, first of all, I want, you to show, uh, I want you to watch the launch trailer of Death Stranding. America mean to you? The way my dad made it sound, we were something special. The glue that held it all together. Love. 
more than a nation, a symbol of freedom and hope. We could bring it all back if we kept on making deliveries and connecting people. He was sure of it. Sam, we want you to go west and finish what Emily started. The people she left behind have been hard at work, setting up chiral network terminals. But these terminals are still isolated. We need you to bring them online. And for that, you'll need a Cupid. This is how we'll rebuild our country. Extinction's on hold for now. I'll be waiting for you on the beach. Sam, Sam. Time's running out. Help, Amelie. She needs you. You have to break some ties to forge others. Keep me tied to everything. The world's still broken. Same as before. What isn't? But we're still here. We're still chugging along. Not everyone. Come on. You put America back together, didn't you? You didn't have to cut all ties and walk away. The president was right about that much. It wasn't anything to walk away from. It's not like I was ever welcome there. Come on. You and I was welcome. extinctions each caused by an extinction entity and now it's time for number six take care of Lou I will couldn't find a working still mother east of Port Knot City it's done enough no more the decommissioning order finally came through dead poor thing was never truly alive not in this world at least alive. Living is no different from being dead if you're all alone. I'm on the beach, Sam. Our beach. The one where I was born. Come and find me. I'm not the only one wearing masks either. There's your boss man, and that woman, and, oh, let's not forget little old you. Did I ever tell you my real name? I wanted to. It's Amerigo. After Amerigo Vespucci, the man who discovered the continent. I thought it was Columbus. Except Amerigo was full of it. He lied. 
America is a lie. For this to work, I'll have to touch you. Close your eyes. Now picture Amelie in her beach. You love her, right? You love her. There it is. Five. Oh, it's almost time. For the players. I tell you what, it makes a massive difference, doesn't it, watching it on the big screen with uh, not on my phone on the bus on the way in. It makes a, a huge difference, isn't it? Uh, I'd also like to welcome onto stage Aki Saito from Kojima Productions, who's going to be looking after the translation for us tonight. So thank you very much for your hard work tonight, Aki. It's a really tough job. <laughs> what Aki's got to do is really hard. He's really, really skilled at what he does. Uh, but we'd also like to welcome onto the stage our next special guest who's going to be talking with us tonight. Uh, he's a director, producer, screener. He does a bit of everything. Is anything he can't do? It's Nicholas Winding Refn, everybody. Can you come up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Uh, so I guess the, the, the place to start, if we're talking about sort of bridging movies and games. Let's talk about storytelling. When you're beginning a project like uh, Death Stranding, what are you thinking about first? Is it because it's a game? Is it the gameplay aspects first? Or are you thinking about that story? I know. Well, I think both, actually. But I kind of have sometimes uh, think about the story first and think about what to do, uh, write a book. And if I decide to make a game, I would think about the gimmick of the game. Or sometimes a visual pops up in my mind, uh, like a scene. And then I kind of think about story then. And one more. I might kind of have it like a normal feeling, like, um, like someone's like chasing me and um, I have to hide. And I, I kind of think of it, uh, and I want to make it in a game, this tension. And I want to kind of re-represent that. So I kind of then think about how, what I put in a game or a story. The approach is all totally different, uh, how I come up with ideas. First, Death Stranding, I had the image of the beach and the dolphins or uh, whales were stranded and a naked guy kind of was on the beach, and that was an imagery first and that started uh, Death Stranding. So you have this, you want to create an emotion in, in, the, in the player. It's difficult in games though because you can't necessarily control, because my experience of playing Death Stranding might be very different to Nicholas's or, or Aki's. So how do you make sure that you, you, the players are getting the experience that you, that you want them to have? Um, well, that's true. But in movies, there's a main character. And you're kind of following his behind from the head. You're kind of following him in a movie. And you're kind of having this experience through the main character. You know, see the drama behind it. But for games, you decide whether you go right or left. So you get more experience uh, in this game because you control that. 
And I think that's one of the powers of the game. And I really want to kind of implement that. So it's a little different than creating a movie, even the story plot. Yeah. Uh, and then what's your process like, Nicholas? Do you start with a, an idea of a story, an emotion, a genre, a setting? Where, where are you beginning your storytelling from? Um, well, it's actually very similar to Hideo. Um, um, you know, we've known each other for quite a number of years now, so um, we're actually very similar. We even look alike. Kind of. <laughs> we're, we're, we've all, we're all wearing the same glasses, aren't we? <laughs> and um, we're both married. We both have kids. We live probably pretty boring lives. So our creativities are kind of otherworldly. And um, But for me, it's always either a vision, something you think about, you see something, someone says something, a concept one day, and I think all creativity comes from some kind of idea of expression. And uh, I gave up trying to figure it out, and I just kind of wait to see what happens. Is it is it difficult in the in the sort of the well, I suppose in, in both the games, movies, television, that that creativity sometimes is sort of not stifled, but, but restricted by what um, publishers or, or people that are going to pay you to make this stuff know sells well or, or people are going to watch. Is, is that, does that hamper your creativity in terms of storytelling at all? I mean, absolutely. But, you know, to, to, if you don't know money in entertainment, it's like a painter not knowing paint, you know, because they're so go hand in hand. Um, of course, the digital revolution has allowed a lot of variations, and you can say creativity is such an important part of our lives, especially our children. I can at least look at my own children and how they use technology creatively. You know, both Hideo and I make an art form that's very expensive. So obviously, we're always out chasing the money to get it made. And, you know, we lie, steal, promise, <laughs> come on, all the things we do to get what we need. But, you know, a lot of it also comes from what else are you going to do with your life? So there is this kind of hunger that comes from it. But, you know, as long as you make something with the intention that it's 100% you and no one loses money, you're going to be okay. Mm. So, Mr. Kojima, you are very famous for making uh, games that are you know, that have stories that are quite complex, that are very m many layers to them. And one of the criticisms of the creative industry in the last decade or so is that things have been simplified. There are very straightforward stories to tell. And is that having an impact on you at all? Do you think going forward, or are you going to keep making your, your games and your stories in the, in the way that you've been doing for thirty odd years? I know. Well, I think simplicity is good, but it gets consumed very quickly. It's like food. Anything that's really digestible, it just goes out and flows, right? <laughs> and it doesn't remain in the body. We've all, we've all been there. We've all been there. So, come on, that's fine. But something that's awkward, that is not really digestible, it remains in your body. And you don't know what it is. And human has this intellectual um, feeling that they kind of like linger. What is this? Like, for instance, a movie, if that lingers in you, you watch it again over and over, or you talk with your friends about that movie, what was that about? Or maybe take time and re-watch again or rethink a bit again. Mm. And you kind of start to understand the real meaning. And it begins to be a real body, your blood and meat. And it remains in your body fluid, not just come out. And I want to create that kind of thing. So whether it's a movie or books, I, I grew up um, watching movies or um, things like that. So I just do that in games. Everyone says it's complicated. 
まあその何回でも持ち帰って、I think everyone should just keep it and maybe nourish it for five or ten years and maybe they will start to understand. And I wanna really wanna create those kind of things. Yeah, so you're looking to make experiences that people、um, have to invest in, don't they? That they have to sort of give of themselves to get get the most out of of your products, I guess. あのー、とか刺激がないと人は成長しないので。I think stimulation is needed to grow. 広く大きく。You kind of find out things you don't know. That's why you grow. So anything you know or anything you easy to eat, you know, you won't grow or your brain won't grow. It won't be an experience. So sometimes I want people to kind of eat something that is not really easy to digest, mine especially, but sometimes maybe have that kind of. But I'd really want to make that thing delicious, mind you. Are you a fast food guy, then, Nicholas, or your more, <laughs> <laughs> or your films more also sort of three course dinners? Or you know, what's how would you de define your work in this context? I'm more like fine wine. <laughs> you have it ages really well. Well, I think I mean,、uh, I mean, there's a great point in that most entertainment is shit. I mean, it is. Even my kids thinks it's shit. And、um, you know what creativity can do, like really nothing else, is that it can penetrate your mind or your heart, however you experience, or your gut, and then it stays with you and it travels with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> and if you look at evolution, culture has always been the forefront of everything. Culture is like oxygen for us, and It's sacred in a way. Very soon, the AI is going to be doing a lot of things of our lives, and it's going to be, take over many parts of our lives. But what the AI can never do, it can never create because it doesn't know failure. It doesn't cry. And creativity is based on the idea that you can fail, and most of us do once in a while. Maybe more in the sense of being now, but if you're fine wine like me, you're just ahead of your time. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, actually,、um, and I think that's what, in a way, is the obligation for people that have the opportunity to create to the mass market is. We, our obligation is to feed, but make it different, because that essentially what's going to make the world a more interesting place. Because creativity inspires a reaction, a reaction creates a thought. And I always say, you know, everyone liking something is just the opposite of everyone hating it. That's easy enough. But if you can create something that people either love. With such a passion, or they hate it so much, that is the first time you've done something correct.、Um, well, I'm sure we'll come on to sort of we'll delve into that a little bit more as we go on. So we've got sort of three sort of themes we're hoping to discuss、uh, this evening. So we're just sort of wrapping up on that sort of theme of storytelling and, and narrative, and we're going to move on to now to talk a little bit about、uh, directing. Um, and the art of direction, because、uh, both have, have, have directed things, you know, differently, and we'll learn a little bit about that as we go. But before we we do that, we're just going to hear now from,、um, well, it doesn't really need an introduction, but somebody who really knows how to direct, and he's got a, a little message for us this evening. You might you might have seen this already, but、um, here's George Miller for you. The creative process is something I've been interested in all my life. Any form of artistry, the process is the same almost always, and that is an interplay between the intellect and the intuition. In the collaborative arts, there is usually one voice. Ultimately, it's usually somebody who not only has the inspiration for the first idea, but has got the mechanism, the skill, the craft to actually progress it and, and, and make it a full work. The person who has that has to do one very important thing, and that is create the strategies 
with which everybody else can work. They have to be coherent, elegant, holistic strategies that unify the piece. The skill that I see in, in great filmmakers, I now see in Kojima San's work. You love her. There it is. Oh, that's strong. Very strong. We're in the hands here of a master in terms of visual representation, taking out of the imagination and making it real on the screen. But that's, to some degree, the necessary surface of the thing. I think thematically, the player is being invited into an experience that is very, very profound and very deep. The purpose of story is to make meaning out of life. I mean, it's, it's, it's fundamental to us. It's the only way we can explain the world and our existence. What's great about Kojima-san's work is the way that you take games and you take what we call cinema and overlaps the two. My body may be present, but my soul is on the beach. I'm already dead. Uh, story is a, a kind of a tricky word because story is not just plot or a series of events. Stories are really the experience offered up to the audience. You can tell a series of events, but in the way that you orchestrate it, just as you might take a group of notes and play them, but not in an inspiring way. But if they do have an elegance in their orchestration, they have meaning to you. That's what powerful story is. And that's what I sense there. Issues of morality, you know, the purpose of life, the proper conduct of life, all the things that all great stories uh, deal with. To take the notion of death and play, it seems to be, a very, very original way to do it. It's something deep down, one way or another, we all confront. And that's already interesting. To have this sort of game which seems to be non-violent in the, in the more traditional way, and yet connect you to the rest of the world. Something I've always thought was really interesting. Everything in this room, everything on, on the roadways we travel, carry with them a tremendous amount of history. We walk in each other's paths, and that's what's happening in this game. So even though you're alone, it seems to be you're following paths of complete strangers, and yet somehow they have an effect on you. That's a very, very powerful analogy to what happens in, in life. It feels to me that the player can have that experience made manifest before them in a very direct way and in a very original way. When you put things out there into the world, you really don't know. You can anticipate what it might be, be like, but it takes quite a bit of time before the world tells you what, what, what the work is like. Sometimes, it takes a long, long time. You know, there's famous stories of art, artist Van Gogh who had no idea that his paintings were going to be so significant. And I think that happens with, with so much work. Glad you made it. That's another thing about Kojima San. I mean, he's proving to be a master in this new arena, relatively new arena, and bringing all the skills, of filmmaking, of drama, of design, of, and putting it in, into a work and it, we get meaning from it. That's the difference between something that's just on the surface and something that's very pr profound. I, I like to describe it as, as, as having a lot of iceberg under the tip. And I, I feel that, that, that this game has a lot of iceberg under the tip. See, it's like I'm not even here. Same as it ever was. There's no cultural evolution unless new ideas are offered up. Often they're provocative, often they, they shift the norm to some degree, but there is no evolution unless that happens. That's the history of, of all creativity. That doesn't, doesn't come easily, oh, I'll just do something radical, radically different, because something can be radically different and basically alienating. It's just, there's nothing to connect me to it. It takes a much more sophisticated level of thinking to actually make something like that work. To understand where the world is today and where it might be down the track, and then to interpret it according to his own creative impulses. And that's where the creative courage comes in. Somebody like Kojima San, who's prepared to push the boundaries. And, and that's why his work is, is, is so important. Thank you.
for the players. George Miller there. Uh, now, George was talking about creative courage, Hideo, and, and picking up also what Nicholas was saying about sort of, if you're going to push the boundary, sometimes not everybody's going to like it. Uh, how, does that, you know, how does that risk make you feel when you're making a new project? Well, if you're doing it alone, it's not a big problem. But this time, I opened up my own studio and I collected staff and rented an office. So, a little bit different than Nicholas, maybe. I can't fail. Because 30 years of game creation, you know, I didn't care because if I fail, uh, I will just leave the company. So, I had no pressure. <laughs> but this time, creating something gave me no pressure to create something new. And uh, I didn't really care about what people thought about it, but I have to be successful in a way because I have to keep my studio going. So that was a little pressure different this time. But it doesn't really change what I create. I just be a little bit cautious, like uh, thinking of my right brain and I kind of output it before, but this time I use a little left side of my brain too, and maybe calculate a little bit before doing my output. And I kind of, you know, defend and be cautious and create what I create in Death Stranding. Mm. But maybe what you see, uh, the finished product, may not be so different from my past product. So, so has the business side compromised the, the, the vision a little bit? Yeah, I compromise a lot every time, like scheduling or you know, when I have to finish the game. Especially the game, I have to battle with the memory size and every day there's these small problems popping up, so I have to really decide on the spot every day. Nicholas also said, we both have to kind of uh, produce, but also start with the concept. And it's not just directing. If you're a director, you don't have the budget. And you don't know how much you could spend. And this is really important, yes. Like Guillermo del Toro said, he does producing as well. If you want to do something you want to do, you have to have the money, and you have to have the understand about money. And also know about people, and I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, you could change the concept or, you know, it's a freedom that you have. So we, we're talking about uh, looking at sort of the idea of direction then and, and picking up on some of the things that, that, that George said. How much, Nicholas, is the role of a director as uh, a visionary or sort of a, a lonely person at the, at the sort of the top of the mountain? Or, you know, are you sort of in the weeds getting, you know, busy with, with the rest of the team? How do you see the role of a director in, in a project? Uh, well, I think, okay, directing is really easy because your main objective is to inspire everyone else around you to do their best. You know, it, directing is, is, is a strange concept because you're not really doing anything specific and you maybe don't even know very much about specific things. But you have to be able to know a little bit about everything. And, and you have to have, uh, you know, military instinctual abilities, you have to understand poetry, you have to understand love and pain and all kinds of, of, of historical ideas of culture and political and, and even the advance of the future. So it's a combination of everything. Um, and it's, it's, 
all directors are different, you know. Um, we do different things, Hideo and I, you know. But we come from the same place, we have the same um, desires and, and we have the same aspirations, we have, we're similar, all of us directors, whether you're in television or movies or video game, it's all kind of come from the same origin. But, you know, you have to look at yourself like a shrink, a kindergarten teacher and a general. <laughs> Which one are you? Not in that order. <laughs> and in terms of your directing skill, is there an influence you're seeing from um, from games that are starting to sort of filter through to the way people are directing sort of um, movies and television programs? Um, well, I think that it's not so much always trying to find the comparisons because it's it's different. I mean, even though there are similarities we should maybe not spend so much trying, time trying to put the connections together, to, but more see them as individual expressions. It's like different canvases. It's like when there was that silly discussion between film and digital and when something was gonna become this or that and it was gonna be uncomparable. It's two different aesthetics. Um, it's all about expressions. And I think that it's more interesting looking at a diverse of it. You can be inspired by it and you can take notice of it, but you know, use it to do what you want to do mm. and don't try to become anything mm. else. And talking about being in, inspired by, by things, cinema uh, has clearly inspired your work in the, in the past, Mr. Kojima, hasn't it? And so um, you know, how is that? Is it continuing to inspire your work at the moment? Yeah, I watch films <laughs> once a day, about like 54 years now. Yeah, of course I love movies. But the reason why I watch movies, I love books too, I read a lot. I really want to go to different places because I want to be knowledgeable and I'm very eager to learn about new things. I don't want to die without knowing a lot of things in the world. So if I go to a bookstore, there's so many books and I, re I want to read every one of it, but I can't read every one of it in the rest of my life. So movies, it's about two, two hours. You just go to the cinema. You could go all around the world by going to watch a movie. You could go to the past or the future. You could be a different gen gender. You could be different jobs. So I love the story, but it's more about the experience I get. In that square screen, there's a world that I don't know. And watching it two hours, just by sitting there. It could educate me. Of course, there's some lies in it. There, for me, movies is like that. That's one. The second point is I, I'm, I'm a creator, and Nicholas is a creator too. And directors are kind of really lonely, and we can't say anything that, and we can't even say that to our families sometimes. And I'm, I'm really, I feel lonely at times. And when I think about that, I watch movies and um, past or like far away or whatever. They're, you know, always like, um, you know, I, I see them uh, like really good movies. It really makes me feel like, oh, it's not just me. There's someone who made this great film and become successful, I, I get this, I, I become brave a little bit by just watching these great movies. I really wanted to be an astronaut when I was a child. But 50 years ago, think about it. There was three human beings went to the moon and came back alive. Of course, recently they haven't gone, but... So if a person could go to the moon and back, you know, I could, I could live another day. I'm, they gave me bravery about that. So those are the two things, um, the reason why I watch a movie once a day. Yeah. Um, and sort of th that experience, I suppose, that you can see reflected in, in the movie because, in the movie, in Death Stranding, um, because we've got Nicholas who performs in the game also 
Guillermo del Toro is in the game. There's a lot of cameos from the world of cinema in the games. Why was that so important to you? Well, not, you know, important about cameos. Like four years ago, I became independent. And I was like 52 or 53. My family said, oh, you should retire. But I wanted to create games still. There's fans out there waiting for my games. But I had nothing. But I, I'm, you know, I'm used to creating games. But I didn't have any staffs or office or um, engine, anything. But what I had was just connections with people. So, with staff, the same, uh, Del Toro and the Nicholas, I had these connections, so um, they came to work in my game. So, um, like artists, um, actors and talents, uh, movie directors too, and I want them to be part of my game. Because it's the game is, is about connection, so I really wanted to use that connection too, um, my personal feelings of like that. So that's why I kind of asked them to be a part of my game. Uh, and uh, we've got a bit of a, an exclusive for you uh, watching at home and here tonight. There is another uh, special guest who appears in Death Stranding, who we're about to get a little sneaky glimpse of now from the game. <laughs> We were told you'd help with the ball testing too. But before we get to that, let's see how she's doing. Hmm. Pretty as a picture. Got nothing bad to say. These bots aren't designed to operate outside the network service area. So let's get the distro center linked up already. Autonomous delivery bots are designed to process some orders for you. Cargo transported by a bot is liable to get a little roughed up if the road's poor. On the flip side, a bot traveling on a well-maintained road is more likely to deliver cargo in better shape. And Edgar's here tonight. Thank you very much, Edgar. Um, did you enjoy your, your time performing in Death Stranding? I think that's my finest work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe you'll get another call now uh, from some of the directors. Maybe Nicholas will call you next time. Uh, <laughs> So how important is, is casting then? You know, you've gone fairly big in this one. Norman Reedus, Leah Seydoux, uh, you, you know, Mads Mikkelsen, big Hollywood names like that. How significant is that for, for not just for this game, but for you know for gaming going forward? Well, 30 years ago, games were like uh, Famicom games. They were like 2D and dots, right? And um, you can't even draw human beings, so it was all, all, all like spaceships. But nowadays, you could see what you saw. If it's like photorealistic, if we create something like a CG from zero for a human being, it doesn't look really like a real human being, funny enough to say. Like if it's like a cartoon, a deformed, that would be okay. But if you try to make a human being from CG, you need the actual materials from a human being. Like like skin, texture, and any game, 
they scan someone and they create a character. Like they sometimes morph with like four or five people. But if that's the case, and if I were to create a character, I wanted to kind of use someone who is great, uh, an actor, like their movement, and people who are more used to and good at their acting. I could make even better characters. I think it's essential these days. So I think you know, scheduling these um, Hollywood act actors are difficult, but I think it'll be a, a normal thing in the gaming world. Um, I think even in movies, casting is very important. Uh, Consumer Sans obviously worked with, with Norman Reedus a lot. You've got um, so your relationship with Ryan Gosling in, in the past. How important is your relationship with a particular performer for the, 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 the movies and the TV shows you, you make, Nicholas? Um, well, I've been very lucky to work with, um, with uh, you know, some absolutely wonderful actors. Um, um, <laughs> I created Mads Mikkelsen, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, I think, and I, 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 I think in a way I speak for both of us here is that our, our actors or actresses are an extension of us, at least in my case, I've, I'm very open about that, that for me, the casting is half the work because whoever they are, are my fantasies of how I would like to be or how I see myself or how 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 what I would like to experience you know because in a way being a director is also very voyeuristic in a way um, so so for me it, it becomes a very personal odyssey with the performer and I, and I mean I shoot in chronologically order also because of that so I never really know how it's going to turn out until I'm done and that is part of the process of, of living your, yourself through the characters and through the performers as they're going about their work, mm. you know, from nine to five every day. Uh, so for me, casting is, is essentially, you know, the thing that moves everything forward. Um, and I think that from a video game perspective, it's... You know, it's it's just it's opened a whole new avenue of opportunities for actors to engage in, and you know we're just at the beginning of of technology, both in movies and. But what's really interesting is how video game is using it because when I did I play Heartman, who I'm told is the most popular character in the game, by the way. <laughs> And um, we're talking about a spin-off, you know, another complete, he has going to have An his own. exclusive view there, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, his, his own series online, mobile game. Um, but um, as a performer, you, you, you come in and you, are, you take your clothes off. So uh, <laughs> um, Hideo was in my show also, so, so we kind of share those, you know, we use each other also physically and visually, but when I came to his, his game, I was told to take my clothes off, uh, which I've never tried in front of many people, and then you, they photograph you in all different situations, and then you make a lot of face movements and you get all these dots around you, and then it's, thank you very much, you can leave now. Um, and what's interesting then is that something that I can't do in movies because I work with physical objects, analog objects, Hideo can then take all this information and he can mold it and create it like a sculpture or a painter. He can, he can modify it to an extent that I could never achieve with what I do. And that was very fascinating to see and even seeing myself becoming part of Hideo's brain, but in a way where he basically took parts of me like Frankenstein and was able to inject things that I could never have imagined to do. And that was very interesting to see. And I think this is just the beginning of that form of technology. So we're gonna see a huge avenue and also even business-wise in terms of how things are moving that 
actors and actresses, performers are no longer afraid of that medium, just like they aren't afraid of small medium like television or streaming. You know, what's been great about the technical revolution is that it has allowed so many more opportunities creatively. You know, when my eldest daughter has a half, an hour and a half's conversation on Skype with a friend, it's like my dinner with Andre, but on a Skype call. She made a movie. Uh, my youngest is obsessed with this TikTok thing, and the creativity is, I mean, my God, if I had that when I was young, it would have been a revolution. And so I think that there are so many, again, avenues because of technology, and, and certainly when it comes to performance of video games, I think, as Hideo says, it's going to be a much more sought out, and we're just at the beginning of what that technology mm -hmm. can allow. Well, unfortunately, we started to run out of time. In fact, we're very quickly running out of time. Uh, so just a couple of sort of uh, relatively shorter questions just to, to finish off. Firstly, Hideo, was he any good? <laughs> what? Are you just um, saying yeah. that? Now? Yeah. Yes, yeah. right. <laughs> well, to quote Trump, I was the best period. <laughs> <laughs> and what was he like as a director? He was the best. I mean, we're, we're soulmates. Yeah. Look at us. We're equal. So uh, it, it seems a bit of a silly question because um, uh, the, the, your g game isn't even out yet. But um, I've interviewed you a couple of times, and I know that you're already thinking about not just the next project, but probably the next three after that. But are you starting to get excited about what's coming next after Death Stranding? Well, I'm kind of not just anxious about it, but also I'm kind of really facing towards the future already. Nicholas is the same, I think. When you finish a project and you have your body is resting and you kind of like take a break and space uh, with the family, but your brain is always constantly thinking. So you finish something and it's going to, uh, well, that's right, this will be released next week, but I'm already thinking about next project and the next, next project and I'm trying to prepare things. But it's a natural thing for me. It's like um, having breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's the same like a loop. It's, a, it's nothing special to me. It's like um, uh, simply as that. But the next project that I could work on, just to think about that, I'm, I'm happy to think that I could work on. I'm still, you know, physically fit to do it. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure we'll be back here another, in a few years' time, asking, pestering, you, pestering you with more questions about whatever comes next. And Nicholas, what are you, what are you sort of, what have you got on your plans for the next six months or so? Or can you know, as a top secret? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> I think that um, uh, I'm very interested in in the idea of the telephone and what that can do. And um, I think, like Hideo was saying. Um, you know, it's almost like when you try one thing, you want to try something else. And um, so I created another um, television show. Because I, one thing that I was very stuck with making films was that the one burden I always ran into was time. You know, uh, there was only so much time I could steal business-wise, not so much from people, but the idea of the theatrical experience, which is still an amazing experience. But, you know, when my own kids tell me, look, Dad, we don't go to the movies anymore, it did get me thinking, like, okay, how can I touch other avenues of opportunities? And so streaming and the idea of the telephone became very interested to me. And... Um, I was going to make actually another movie, but I decided to do another show first again because the idea of length is something f that the feature film has always been struggling with. But the irony is that when film was invented, it was fairly normal to have four, five, six hours of mass entertainment where 5,000 people would sit in stadiums and watch it. That has now moved into another area, another arena, which is also cinema. It's just 
an altercation of it. So I think that um, we're always seeking out the next level. And I've obviously, one day we'll make a video game together. Yeah. Uh, great, so you're going to make a video game together one day then? Well, we always talk about that during dinner. My next project or the next, next one, but I really want to do something a little different. In the next five years, it'll be like the platform will be streaming. Either it's a movie or a game. Both will remain, the cinema experiment, experience and the platform of games will remain, but it's a game. But you could broadcast that right now. Like esports that you see today. I think there's something ahead, and I'm thinking about that. It's not, well, it's like a movie. It's, it's a movie, but it's a game. You know, I'm thinking of that kind of idea. Yeah. And I want to do that kind of thing. <laughs> I can't really say that <laughs> so much. <laughs> I think call Hartman. <laughs> well, yeah, Hartman could have a, yeah appearance. <laughs> Hartman, the CD is coming at you soon. You hear it here first. Uh, well, listen, unfortunately, our time has run out. But if you're really interested in seeing how Kojima-san goes about doing his work and how the final days of putting Death Stranding were together, we were there when the game goes goal. I do feel sorry for Mr. Kojima because he was trying to announce to the entire Kojima production staff that the game had gone goal. It was finished. And my cameraman, Matt, had a camera right jabbed up in his face. So uh, we appreciate his patience. You can watch that. It's going to be live on the BBC iPlayer on Monday. Go and check it out. Thank you very much. That's my second plug. But if you could Please give us a warm, warm round of applause for Nicholas Wenning Refn and Hideo Kojima. Thank you very much. Thank you. Konnichiwa. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers.